Hi, beloved of the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, I have a deep word for you today. It's one that's been on my heart for some time. It's one that I needed to pray about because it is very impactful to each of our lives and to the body of Christ and to the world at large. I'm here to say that there is a storm coming. Now, a storm has different connotations to people. A storm in the physical sounds very daunting because a storm can bring destruction. A storm in the physical world comes with sometimes a crashing thunder. But there is a storm coming that is of a spiritual kind. There's a storm that God has poured forth throughout history. At times, that storm has been used as God's judgment. And at times, that storm has cleared the air, that is the spiritual air. We know that a storm naturally, that is in, the, in nature, can clear the air after the storm. And sometimes that can be the case in terms of a spiritual storm that God pours forth. But then there's the destruction that a storm can enact or that can cause. That storm that is coming, beloved, is one that will bring some destruction. Now, I don't like bringing these messages. I am a person of great hope, and I know Jesus Having been with him in heaven, I know that our future is beyond words. The best is truly yet to come. But we're in the midst of what will be a pending storm. Now, here's the good news. If you are indeed a believer in Yeshua, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, and that is, you will be protected from the storm Zechariah has told us so, as well as Isaiah. I'm going to read from uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, which says this. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. He's talking about her being the church, that is the body of believers, God's children. And then in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, it says this. For thou has been a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. There shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a cover from storm and from rain. And that comes from Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6. What does this mean? It meant at that period of time, there was persecution against the Jewish people in Israel. And for those who are students of the Bible, you will know that there were numerous attacks against God's people. Some of them were victorious, certainly in the case of David and his battles. Some of them caused the destruction of the Jewish people. But God was always on their side. And Isaiah and Zechariah, being prophets, foretold that even though the storm may arise, that storm of destruction would not cause the destruction of his people. That same word applies to today. Those who are in Christ Jesus will not be at the effect of the storm, even though we will experience that storm. There's another advantage that God gives to those who hear his voice. Now, during the Old Testament times, God spoke primarily through the prophets. The prophets would hear from God and they would declare God's truth. 
Now, there was a tremendous penalty against any prophets during those times who would speak in untruth. That is something that was not of God. In fact, the penalty for speaking a lie, that is something apart from God, which was not either validated by those in the Jewish body or was something that came to be known as uh, falsehood or something that didn't bear out. The penalty was death. Death to the prophet because it was so critically important that the prophet speak the truth because that was the primary way in which God spoke to his people through those like Isaiah, Zechariah, and others who were prophets during that time. Now, prophecy did not end after the time of Christ on earth. No, prophecy continued. There's nothing in the Bible that shows that any of the gifts has ce have ceased. In fact, we know today that prophets speak God's truth. It can be a forewarning, but ultimately it is by Greek definition, that is the Greek interpret or translation of prophecy is truth-telling. Truth-telling is basically hearing a thing from God and speaking it forth. Sometimes that truth-telling can be foretelling, as with what I am sharing with you today. Foretelling an event. Now, why would God foretell an event? Primarily, it is because he wants us to be prepared. He foretells something that we could prepare ourselves for what is to happen. That was the advantage of prophecy that carried forth for the protection of the Jewish people that carries forth for the protection of God's people today. Always, God gives a forewarning to his people to do that which will be necessary to protect them from the storm that is the spiritual storm that is about to happen. Now that's a word coming to you today that the spiritual storm is coming and it's time to take shelter. Who is that shelter? That shelter is God. It is the Holy Spirit. Shelter comes when we immerse ourselves in the presence of God, steep ourselves. We do that through prayer. We do that through the reading of his word, which builds faith. It comes through some podcasts that we've done with you when you hear testimonies of God's love and of heaven and the promise of heaven. You know, one of the primary reasons we do those podcasts and the forthcoming Heaven Encounter series, which will be broadcast on the Sid Roth Network, is that we are emboldening people with faith in God. Many lack faith, especially in times of trouble, and we are living in times of trouble. Rumors of war and war itself diseases, pestilence, which was prophesied in the Old Testament, which we've seen with plagues of COVID and other diseases, such as recently monkeypox. These things are happening now on a global scale, which is not yet, by the way, the storm. Again, I say, that is not yet the storm. These are foretelling of the storm. Now, in Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, it says, I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and by the ministry of the prophets. And in Zechariah, again, chapter 7, verse 7, he says, God the Lord hath cried by the former prophets 
when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity. Jerusalem faced uh, these attacks, a degree of destruction, but they were saved from destruction because the prophets foretold them. There were a number of instances when God spoke, whether it be David or he spoke to Gideon, and he spoke very clearly to Gideon. Gideon had an army and he was being attacked and his army was fairly large, but the army against which he was fighting was multiple times larger than his army. And God told Gideon, using the prophets as well, to actually shrink his army. That's right, to down to a hundred army soldiers. Now, on the surface, Gideon would have thought that's a foolish thing to do, but God was protecting the Jewish people and Gideon, in fact, gained the victory. But it was the prophets who were speaking what Gideon needed to do in order to be successful against the enemy. So I'm going to share with you what you can do to be successful against the enemy that is the powers, principalities, and spirits of darkness. One caveat I'm going to say is that the enemy is not flesh and blood. The enemy is not your political adversary. The enemy is not even those who are of a different, let's say, religion. No, that's not the enemy. The enemy is the one behind all of it. The enemies are what the Bible references as the powers, principalities, and the spirits of darkness, the demonic realm, which is, in the, which is in the second heaven. That's where spiritual warfare is going on right now. It's a spiritual warfare going on for you, the angels battling in the spiritual realm against the demons, the demons battling against the angels and God. We have to always keep in mind that God's only purpose is is to lovingly call us to himself. That is God's purpose. So he has a purpose through all of the things, the rebellion, that is due to our having free will and our enemies having free will. That cannot be denied. That is a fact that cannot be taken away by God. It is established, and that's why we have evil in this world. It is not by virtue of God not, not desiring to eradicate evil. It is because he must do a thing to an eliminate eventually evil itself. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And that's the storm. The storm is coming, beloved, because all of the persecution, all of the martyrdom that is occurring today and has been for some time must come to an end. Uh, persecution against Christians, against the Jews is happening now on a grand scale. We just don't see it many times in the Western world, but it's there. So God is not going to tarry much longer. Know this from 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 19. He sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testify against them, but they would not give ear. What happened? In the time of Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he found the people that had actually gone through the exodus from Egypt, seen the parting of the waters, and now were on their way to the promised land, he saw them building a golden calf. There was a rebellion against God. How could they possibly do that? They'd seen miracles. They saw food falling from the sky and water in the desert. How could they possibly have rejected God? 
is because they did not listen to the prophets. Now, this is not a message really hearkening any of us to be faithful unto the prophets. No, it is to be faithful unto God and to hear his voice, to hear God declaring in the midst of what is an impending storm. Can you imagine, imagine falling under that condition of idol worship, such as the Jews? In that time of Moses, uh, say, I have no desire, you might say, to build a calf. I don't worship any idol. Well, not completely true. We, as a people, have worshipped idols. And idols, you see, by definition, is anything that takes our attention off of God and puts it on something or someone else. Well, you might say, well, what if I watch a TV program <laughs> or what if I'm, you know, if I'm surfing on the web, you know, is that taking my attention off of God? Uh, only, beloved, if we are not keeping our attention focused on him, at the same time, we're asking him to highlight the things that we are seeing, the places we go with the things he desires us to see and know. You see, that's part of being constantly in communion with God because the Spirit resides in us. We are the temple of the living Spirit that is the Holy Spirit. So we can always be in fellowship asking God just to give us insight about things, to speak a word to our heart, to keep us on the straight and narrow. Now, I want to now point to something about the storm in Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 28 through 29. It says, I will lay the land most desolate and the pomp of her strength shall cease and the mountain of Israel shall be desolate because all, all of their abominations, because of all of their abominations which they have committed. Hmm. Did that just bring you down? <laughs> we, uh, you know, as a, as a people, as followers of Christ, have sinned at times, some more egregiously than others, but sin is sin, ultimately. An abomination to God is simply a sin that destroys our relationship. Because God ultimately desires relationship foremost. Anything that would impede that relationship with him is a sin. Anything that would be apart from what he has called us to do and thinking good things and doing that which is good is a sin. So what happened in that time is that there was a desolation in the land. Now I want to express a, a caveat to all of this, which is that the desolation that came was not just to God's people. Again, God protected his people through the desolation. There was desolation, des, desolation in the land. Even when the Jewish people in the, set, the generation after Moses went into the promised land, there were giants to conquer. And Joshua led the armies of God against the giants that inhabited the promised land, which is today the land of Israel. No, desolation and all of the things that have to do with the coming storm and judgment will not destroy God's people, you and me, if you are a believer in Jesus as your Lord. No, there is just a forewarning. Why is there a forewarning of the coming storm? There's a forewarning that is twofold. One is what happens in the natural as reflected in the spiritual, which is the storm will clear out the debris. And there is something that has happening now that is also in the Bible, which is a reference to a parable of the, the wheat and the shaft. The wheat would be the wheat that we grow in the field, that are many of our foods. 
the shaft being the weeds that try to crowd out the wheat. And the parable of the wheat and the shaft is that God would clear out the weeds such that they needed to grow up to a certain level where they could be weeded out, and that would allow the wheat to grow. And that's what's happening now. That is, the weeds that have grown up seem to be just pervasive and crowding out that which is good. But that's not really what's happening, because the things that we see in the natural, some of the evil doings that are taking place now, that we see and have seen, quite frankly, through the course of history, are not intended really to crowd out God's beloved people, you and me. Instead, there is a time where God will remove the weeds. That is the impending storm. The weeds, beloved, and this should offer you some hope, that is those things which are crowding out God's beloved and God's purpose that he desires for us in this world, those weeds are growing up. That is, they seem to be getting stronger. But in fact, the storm will clear out those weeds. Now, what will be left will be like a storm after the storm will be a clearing of the air. There will be a revival. There will be people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior in an expansive way beyond anything we have seen in the course of history. We will see healings. We will see people rising from the dead. We will see things like prophecy and teachings and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the gifted gifts that the Holy Spirit provides that are going to be exponentially provided to the body of Christ. And we will see these gifts fully realized in the clearing that will happen through the storm. Now, as it was with all past societies and church bodies, the church today is in no mood to receive bad news. <laughs> we, we've kind of avoided bad news, haven't we? We've gotten very comfortable in our fellowship and our just going about our daily business. Well, God doesn't want us to just go about our daily business. He's called us to get serious about our faith in God. He's making us uncomfortable. You know, when you exercise, <laughs> maybe you've heard instructors say, get uncomfortable, you know? Stress yourself for a while. It builds your heart. It makes you stronger. Well, you know, that same thing is going on. We've gotten too comfortable. Now, God is saying, I want you to get serious about me. I want church where we're actually supporting one another. I want my body to treat one another, not only in love, but in interdependence so that when one part of the body is hurting, as Paul explained in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that is our attention goes to that person and we help that person who is hurting. We draw our attention to those who are in need and we provide for that need. Christians, beloved, by the thousands, are casting off the yoke of Christ. It's been happening during the course of church history, but there are also believers, like you, I'm imagining, who are very dedicated. You're getting in the weeds, knowing that the Lord wants us to till the soil, that is to evangelize, share the great news, to be that expression of God's love to a hurting world. In Amos, that's probably a book that you haven't read for a while, chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Behold, the days come, 
saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now notice that this verse doesn't say there will be a famine of preaching or teaching or anything that will be coming from those who are in Christ, who are sharing the truth of God. No, the fact is God would never hold back his warnings or his teachings or his giftings from the church because only his truth can set us free. No, that's why he sends people into the world and you are in the world to share the truth of God, such as in John 8.32, others who are captive by powers, principalities, spirits of darkness, that is, those who are deceived might be set free and know that Jesus is Lord. Amos' prophecy was all about shallowness. Now, shallowness is something that we have seen for a long, long time. My admonition and encouragement to you today, because everything the Lord expresses to us is not in correction and in what is foretelling of his judgment, is for a better tomorrow, a better future. And that's what lies ahead, ultimately, beloved. When the storm is complete... Those of us who are in Jesus will go home. He will take us into heaven. You've heard about heaven so many times on this program that you know heaven is real and it's intended for you as a believer and you will not see hell, certainly, or if you have confessed your sins unto the Lord, unto the Lord Jesus, and ask for him to forgive you of your sins and to take the lordship, lordship over your life, that is. Amos chapter 8, 11 tells us that the Lord is coming. Beloved of the Lord, here is my concluding message to you. There is a storm. It will be a storm of judgment, but it will also clear away the shaft, the weeds, that which is wicked in the world. You will be protected from that storm. And the way that you can protect yourself is to draw closer to God. Is to draw closer to God in your prayer time and your ongoing conversations with the Lord. In attending a fellowship group and small groups and churches and, and also, yes, even and our connections one to another. When we do those things, we are protected from the storm. We've all been forewarned that the storm is coming, but there's a clearing and a freshness that will come as well as a result of that storm. And that will be an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit before he claims his church. Subsequent to what is commonly called the rapture, we will see three and a half years of peace. Once the body of Christ is raptured into heaven, there will be a period of about three years in which those left behind will say, ah, oh, we got rid of those people. <laughs> well, it's not funny, is it? Because it's a deception. Then, the storm that comes at the point where if you as a believer, you have confessed your sins, that is, you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will not be at the effect of that storm. It will be a second storm, which will be the judgment of God, spoken of in the book of Revelation. That is the time, beloved of the Lord, that we must give encouragement to each other that we will be spared of that, but it also is imperative that we also show the love of God to those who don't know Jesus as their Lord so that we might 
B, well, in a manner of speaking, the skin on the face of God, the Holy Spirit, to the world. Beloved of the Lord, now is the time. Now is the time to prepare ourselves for what God has in store, which is good and is righteous and is holy and is desirous to see those who desire the truth to know Jesus as their Lord. Beloved of the Lord, God loves you more than you could possibly know. This I know, having seen him in heaven. Bless you today and always, for God is on your side. Take care. Until we meet again, if you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer. Heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.